Listen, there are, there are, I guess, many things in life that I cannot get my head around, but one of the things that I have never, ever been able to get my head around is algebra. Come on, do I get a witness from anybody out there? I mean, I, I, could, I could get my head around numbers. Numbers is fine. Maths with an S, America. Maths is fine. I could get my head around numbers, but when they started to introduce the alphabet to the numbers, that's when it went stupid. Do we have any maths teachers out there? Give me a wave. Ben, 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 Ben. Algebra, give me a wave if algebra was something you struggled with. Give me a wave. Give me a wave at home watching online if you struggled with algebra. Algebra, algebra, what a nonsense algebra was. I could, to, to put numbers and letters together, ridiculous. Now, having said that, I wonder if you can read this. It's coming up on screen. If you can read it, give me a wave. If you can't read it, give me a wave. <laughs> Four people are like, Pastor Stewart, would you read this out for us? Yeah. Ha -ha. This message serves to prove how our minds can do amazing things, impressive things. In the beginning, it was hard, but now on this line, your mind is reading it automatically without even thinking about it. Be proud. Only certain people can read this. This audacious life. Jeans too tight to jump up there. <laughs> like numbers and letters, I, I can read that, but have a look at these few photos here regarding algebra. Honestly, I mean, algebra it literally confused me for so long. Maths problems, call 1-800, 10 times 13 to, to the power of sin, whatever. Jobs that require the use of algebra. Only one algebra teacher. <laughs> I love this one, this sarcasm one. Find X, here it is. Another day gone by and I didn't use algebra once. Come on, if you can give me a witness to that. Give me a, I have never, ever, 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 ever in my life used algebra once. Not once. I actually am, a, uh, I, I, I am an ordained, credentialed minister. I am in the Assemblies of God in Great Britain. And it is the largest Pentecostal denomination in the world that we belong to. Pastor Stewart just this week has been elected to the board of that movement of churches. Can we put our hands together? For, so technically, Pastor Stewart is now my boss. He's loving that right now. I'm not too sure how I feel about that. But I've got to be honest, I, I, I've got a picture on my credential card and, and, I, and I got this, this credentials, this ordination, whatever you want to call it, 20 years ago, right? And in 20 years ago, 20, in 20 years, not once, not once, never, ever, ever has anybody asked me to see whether or not I am a proper, proper, proper ordained minister. Never once. I, I carry it with me in the hope that one day I rock up to hospitals outside of hospital visiting hours, say, hi, I'm Mr. of Church, just visiting that. And somebody says, sure, go, go on down. It's ridiculous. But algebra, I've never used, ever. I still can't get my head around it. Listen, I wonder if we can try for a moment to get our head around one of the most impossible subjects to understand in the world, which has to be the love of God. Yeah. Friend, how do you plunge the depths of trying to describe this magnificent, crazy, reckless, wonderful love of God. For 2,000 years, the church has been talking about it. There are thousands of textbooks, thousands of scholarly articles on the love of God, and we're not even coming close to really trying to understand. But I wonder if we could just move ourselves forward just a little bit in understanding something more of the magnificence and the depth of the, the love and the wonder of God. John chapter 3, 16 is based in the story of Nicodemus. 
an upper middle class man who has really everything he wants. He's successful in politics as well as in religion. He had high status in the day and yet still something was missing. So he goes to Jesus and says, Jesus, uh, I don't know what to do. I've got everything, but something's missing. And Jesus in John chapter three says this, you must be born again. In other words, he's letting you know that you can have everything that that the flesh can buy and you can achieve everything in university and have so many letters behind your name, but you must be born again. Jesus says, flesh gives birth to flesh. That's not just a woman giving birth to a baby, but that is also the idea that you in your flesh can achieve things in your flesh You can get a new job, you can get a different house, you can have a great relationship, you can get knighted by the queen. Flesh gives birth to flesh. But Jesus says, spirit gives birth to spirit. You must be born again. You must have this experience where your spirit on the inside comes alive to the wonder and the presence and the reality of Jesus Christ. That's what Jesus is saying here. And when Jesus lands on John chapter 3, 16, he, he's kind of letting Nicodemus and, and, and us know several things. He says, for God so loved, he says that to dispel the myth, to let you know that God is not angry, sad, bad, or mad, but that God is a God of love. He says, for God so loved the world that he gave. He wants you to know that love is an action. Love is giving. Not only did he give, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Thirdly, love demands the best. And where we ended up last week is that it says, so whosoever may believe in him. And I wanna spend the next 32 minutes sitting on that one word, whosoever. Because here's what I want you to understand today, church. Whosoever means whosoever. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever. In other words, anyone on one side and everyone on the extreme, the love of God puts its hands on everybody and says, my love includes you. God's love does. What God tends to do is this. God loves the cordial all the way through to the callous. He loves the pious all the way through to the pitiful. He loves the upper class all the way through to the underclass. He loves the rich all the way through to the poor. He loves the city all the way through to United. Everybody in between, including Preston North End fans, God loves us all. He says, for whosoever... Now I wonder, by what stretch of the imagination could you ever exclude anybody from the whosoever? To exclude anybody from the whosoever of God's love is to do severe injustice to the recklessness of God's love. God excludes no one. Did you hear me, friend? God excludes no one. For God so loved the world. Here's where I think our problem is. I don't think our problem is so much with the universality of God's love. I think our problem exists when we bring God's love closer to home. Let me explain. I don't really have a problem with trying to get my head around how God loves the people I love. I understand why God loves Sophie, Georgia, Jaden, Julie, Johnny. I understand why God loves nice people. That kind of makes sense to me. But folks, honestly, I cannot get my head around why God would like people that I don't like. Have you ever prayed the prayer? God, if you love me, then you'd get them. (laughs) Come on, stop being so religious all of a sudden. Have you you ever ever prayed, God, if, if you were really on my side, then you'd show that person a thing to, I, I, I struggle to get my head around how God can love evil people. How does a God of love love an innocent child and Adolf Hitler? How does he do that? And yet the Bible teaches us that God loves everybody from the cordial to the callous, the pious, 
to the pitiful, the Bible says His God, His, His love is for whosoever, anyone and, and everyone. To exclude anyone, folks, is to be a severe, to do a severe injustice to the magnificence of God's love and what His love is absolutely like. But it says here, God loves whosoever. Did you know something? I'm a whosoever. You're a whosoever. The person next to you is a whosoever. The rich, the poor, the upper class, the underclass, the good, the evil, they all feature within this band of whosoever. Acts chapter 10, 34, Peter fairly exploded with good news. It's God's own truth. Nothing could be plainer. God plays no favorites. It makes no difference who you are or where you're from. If you want God and are ready to do as He says, the door is open. Church, you may be a whosoever, but I want you to know you are just as important as Mother Teresa was. You are just as important as the great Nelson Mandela's. You are just as important as Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Rebecca, Gideon, Joseph, Peter, James, John, the mother Mary, because they were all whosoever's, and so are you. Whosoever means whosoever. Not only that, but what I want you to get with whosoever is this, is that whosoever is the great equalizer. I mean, there are certain things in life that, that, that are equalizers. Let me explain what I mean. It kind of gets us to the same level. My auntie, Auntie Ev, she said to me about 15 years ago, 12 years ago, she said, Glenn, do you get nervous when you stand in front of people to speak? I said, well, sometimes, Auntie Ev, I do. She said, do you, do you get nervous when you meet influential people in society and the world? And I said, well, sometimes I do. Yeah, of course. She said, let me help you out with something. And this is literally what she said. She said, remember this. Everybody goes to the toilet. <laughs> and I thought, this is good news. <laughs> the next time I, 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 I was intimidated and felt intimidated because I, I stood in front of a vast amount of people or every time, or not every time, but certain times when I felt intimidated by certain individual, my auntie Ev. Remember, Glenn, the prime minister goes to the toilet too. It's amazing how the toilet's a great equalizer. Do you know something else that's a great equalizer? If I can just change, I don't want to make you sad, but death is a great equalizer. The Bible says it's appointed unto us all that we will all die once. I mean, the beautiful thing about John chapter three is that John chapter three helps us to understand that we all have an opportunity to be born twice, but we will all die once. When my dad died 22 years ago, an hour afterwards, I remember driving through the streets of, of New South Wales where we were living, and, I, and I, remember, I remember watching people walking the dog and laughing and telling jokes on the street and people going in to buy bread and milk and coming out. And I felt like winding down the window and said, stop! Don't you know what's just happened? But you know something, death is a great equalizer. I noticed the world kept turning and people kept moving and I realized I was reminded again at that point 22 years ago that the world does not revolve around me. That there's just a part that I play within the context of, of the world. But I want you to know, folks, that whosoever is a great equalizer. It is a great equalizer. The third thing I want you to get your head around here with whosoever is this, is that whosoever means I don't have to be someone else. I love this. I can be me. I make a rubbish Tony Lagaway. When I was 13, I met Tony Lagaway on a Thursday night at Skater Haven. Because every Thursday night and every Saturday afternoon, I would go to Christian Skate. It's as cheesy as it sounds. I'm proper talking about proper skating. I'm talking about four wheels on each of your shoes. Roller skating, of course, is going to come back around. I can't wait until it comes back around. I'm going to teach you kids a thing or two about. I used to go every Thursday night 
outside every Saturday afternoon to Christian Skate. It was a cool place to be. You know what, Skater Haven, that roller skating rink was my rink. I owned it every Thursday night, every Saturday afternoon. I was the man. As the DJ would say, speed skate. The lights would go down, the strobes would flash, the smoke machine would go, and then they'd play Striper and Petra. <laughs> and I'd be out there doing the tricks and going fast, and I'll never forget at the age of 13 as I sat in Skater Haven and Tony Lagerway walked in. He had his Westie shirt on, checks. He had some baggy jeans. He had shaved hair on the side and a mullet at the back. And he was the man. I remember looking at his skates thinking they're good skates. I checked out the wheels, they were Zenith Zinger wheels. And then I saw him get on, he started to skate. The DJ shouts out, speed skate. The lights changed, the smoke went, the music went up. I jumped onto the rink and I tried to skate with him and it didn't matter what I could do, I tried everything. In that moment, I was weighed, I was measured, and I was found wanting. And for the next two years, before my family moved from Australia back to England, every Thursday night and Saturday afternoon, I tried to be Tony Lagerway. Dude, even his name was cool. I was trying to do it the Jesus way. He was doing it the Lager way. I, I, I wanted to go that way as well. I make a rubbish Tony Lager way. I make a rubbish Tony Campolo. I don't know if you know that name or not, but in the Christian world globally, he is one of the statesmen, one of the great leaders, one of the great movers and shakers of the Christian world globally. And about 21 years ago, I went to speak in Ireland at an event. Both Sophie and I were there. We did some schools for the week. And when we arrived, they picked us up at the airport. They said, Glenn, so great to have you and Sophie here. And then they said this, Glenn, last month, because you know this event we do is monthly, last month we had Tony Campolo. He was amazing. He'd written about, I don't know, 50 books by that time. He was outstanding. They said the month before that, we had Reinhard Bonnke, the great healing evangelist. He was outstanding. People were being healed. We were killing people just so we could raise people from the dead. And they started to give me this history of all these great people that they had. And then they said to me, but we just want you to be you. I thought, yeah, kill me now, why don't you? I genuinely thought that on the Friday night event, as I got up to speak, the only way for me to do what I had to do was to be a little bit like Tony Campolo, to be a little bit like Reinhard Bonnke and the others, the Mark Ritchies who'd been there, Mr. Funny Man himself. And that night, as I got up to speak to all these people, I'm here to let you know it was singularly the worst sermon I have ever preached. I mean, you thought I preached bad sometimes. You've never heard this one. It was so bad, I cut the whole thing short. I got to the end, I got to the end, every head bowed, lots of people there. People there were invited to hear the gospel, to respond to Jesus. I said, with every head bowed, every eye closed, if you're here, you don't know Jesus, you wanna connect with Jesus, put up your hand. I'm here to tell you that in that moment, even the Holy Spirit whispered to me, said, Glenn, you're on your own, I'm off for a latte. <laughs> As I stood in a lonely moment, are there any hands, any hands at all? Is that a hand? No, it's a hat. Any hands, any hands. It was so lonely, tumbleweed blew through the altar. It was so bad that the person on the front row who was running the event put up their hand so I could say, I see that hand, let's pray. <laughs> Do you remember it? That night I got into bed. I said to Sophie, I'm never gonna preach again. And Sophie in her ever compassionate self said, so don't be so silly, she rolled over and went back to sleep. And, and my mind started playing that clip over and over again. Is that a hand? No, it's a hat. Is that a hand? No, it's a hat. Is that a hand? No, it's a hat. I make a rubbish, somebody else. But I'm the best me on the planet. It's all about me. Glenny. I can't be you. And you can't be me. And every time I try to be someone else, something goes wrong. I think that's because the Apostle Paul, he says these words. He says, my grace, God speaking, my grace is sufficient for you. 
for you. His grace is sufficient for, for you and, and for you and for you and for you and for you. Not for you to be someone else, but for you to be you. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. His power may rest on me. I love this because Paul here, he's not trying to be someone else. He just knows that he's, he's who he is. Audacious church, God made you. Folks, would you look at me for a moment? God made you. I know science says one thing today, but the Bible says God made you. The Bible says God set you apart. You. The Bible says God called you by name. The Bible says God appointed you. God saved you. God has a plan for you. God doesn't bless you to be someone else. God chose you to be you, which is good news. You know why it's good news? It means this, I don't have to be good enough. And I love this about God. You see, God's love is not preconditioned on our perfection. God chose you as the whosoever. God's not saying to you, I want you to be perfect before I can use you. He's not saying, I want you to be like someone else before I can choose you. No, His love for us is not preconditioned on our perfection being a certain way because whosoever is not qualified by how good or bad you are. In reality, this whosoever love, God says, I don't care if you're good, you're bad, you're rich, you're poor, you're pious, you're pitiful, you're classy, you're callous. His love is for whosoever. How does that make you feel? How does that make you feel? He just loves me as I am. This is not a standard I'm trying to come up to. Uh, James 3, 2, uh, we all stumble in many ways. We all do. I can't come up to this amazing standard. Romans 8, 35, 37, can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean He no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? No, despite all these things, Overwhelming victory is ours through Christ, who loved us, Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates His love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I don't have to be good enough. I don't even have to be a somebody. Society says this. Through social media, it says you've got to have more followers, you've got to have more likes, you've got to have something, you've got to be a somebody in order to achieve that. And TV becomes the wannabes watching the have alreadys, but the whosoever ignores all that. Because church, I want you to know, God doesn't care what qualifications you have. He's not looking at your bank balance. He's not looking at your religious chart on how well you've done today in order to receive or, or to achieve any level of God's love, it's helping me to understand that I don't have to be a somebody. Friend, I was born a whosoever. I was raised a whosoever. I went to school a whosoever. Praise God, I got saved a whosoever. I've lived for God as a whosoever. I went to Bible college as a whosoever. I stood at the altar as the bride walked down the aisle as a whosoever. We came to England 22 years ago as whosoever's. And 11 years ago, we started the church as a whosoever. And it doesn't matter what I do, there's nothing I can do that can make me a somebody. And I love this because I don't have to be a somebody in God, neither do you. But let me tell you something, something happened. When you responded to God's love, you went from being a whosoever to being a somebody in God's eyes, but make no mistake, friend, we're still whosoever's. We're still saved by grace. We're still the type of people who've been welcomed in, not because of what we could do or achieve, but because God said, welcome whosoever. A few years ago, Josh Cocker and I, Josh, we went to Singapore, and the Sunday night was free. And on the Sunday afternoon, the pastor said, said hey, it's the closing ceremony of the Southeast Asia Games. Would you guys like to go? 
So we went to this magnificent indoor stadium in Singapore. They did this lighting show on the, on the closed roof of the stadium and all the athletes came by and paraded by and it was fantastic, people cheering, the music playing. And then at the end, it turned into a party. Now you gotta realize this, everybody was stood in the, sat, sat in the stands cheering and applauding, but then they brought in an, an, an Avicii type character, I think it was, they, they swung him in over the crowd and then the music started. And you could see people wanted to dance and people were dancing in their places. You gotta understand that at the bottom of the bleachers were, were, were these stewards and there were these barriers stopping people from getting, getting onto the athletics track and, and, and onto the grass, but it took one person, one person walked up to the barrier, went like this, and ran into the middle of the pitch with a DJ overhead, swinging overhead, playing, playing these beats, playing this tune. And as soon as one went, two went, four went. And at first, the stewards are saying, sorry, sorry, sorry. Can I just create an analogy with the Bible? The Old Testament created rules, said sorry, can't come in got to do these things, got to achieve these things. But then Jesus Christ came, John 3, 16, and the stewards got out of the way and said, off you go. And it was beautiful as we all went down on the barriers, we ran out onto the pitch, we ran out onto the DJ, and tens of thousands of people dancing, having a good time. It was funny, because Josh, our youth pastor over here, got hit on a few times by some girls from Southeast Asia. In fact, I got a picture of you in the crowd with a girl with her arm around you. I sent it to Carly just to keep you in check. But I want you to see here that this is what God's love does. God's love says whoever you are, wherever you're from, whatever you, you don't have to be good enough. You don't have to be a somebody. Come on down. I love that. His love says, come on down, get involved. Church, I want you to know that whosoever is here. That not only is whosoever mean whosoever, whosoever uh, means that I have to be someone else. It's a great equalizer, but also whosoever is here. Would you look around for a moment? Look to your left, look to your right. And tap one of your friends on the, on the leg there and just say, hey, whosoever, how you doing? I wanna say this, welcome to a church full of whosoever's. Welcome to a church. We literally, every single one of us as individuals and as a collective, we all are a gathering of whosoever's. I'll tell you what I find really crazy in society is this, is that we expect perfection from other people, but then want those same other people to show us grace. We read about it in the news, such and such a person, they've been through their education, they've been years in the job, they make a mistake, and society says, you gotta go! And so we have people who are losing their jobs because they weren't perfect after all, but the Bible's been saying all the time. We're just whosoever's. If you uh, were to fly to New York, you'd land at an airport called LaGuardia, LaGuardia Airport, which I think is named after the mayor of New York, Fiorello or Fiorella LaGuardia, from the 1930s. He was the mayor of New York during the Great Depression. He was known to being, for being a really lovable guy, a really lovable character. He would ride the fire trucks in the city just for the heck of it. But he was a kind and gracious man as well. He would often go up to orphanages and pay for the whole orphanage to go with him to go to baseball games. On one particularly cold night in January 1935, he decided to go to the night court. He went to night court downtown New York. The judge was presiding over some, some, some cases. He, he, he excused the judge. He said, listen, I'll take the bench for the night. And he sat there. And when he sat down, within moments, an elderly lady, ragged, uh, war-taught um, clothes, just dirty, disheveled, uh, an elderly lady was brought before him, charged with stealing bread. He said to her, why did you steal the bread? 
She said, my son-in-law is sick. My wife is looking after him. Neither of them have a job. And then she said, I can't stand seeing my grandkids starve anymore. So I stole a loaf of bread. LaGuardia, he sighed. He said, listen, ma'am, I'm so sorry. The law requires that you are fined for theft. You see, the shopkeeper was not going to let that elderly lady off. And so he said, the law requires that you pay either a $10 fine, equivalent money, about 150 bucks today, or you go to jail for 10 days. And even as he pronounced guilty over this elderly lady, he put his hand in his pocket, he pulled out a $10 note, he put it in a hat, and he says, and here is the 10 pounds to pay the fine. Then he said this. He said, to every person who's in this court right now, I charge you, fine you 50 cents each, equivalent money, about $3.50, 50 cents each for allowing us to live in a city where an old lady has to steal bread to pay for her grandkids. Bailiffs, please collect the fines. That night in that courtroom, over $700 was given to an elderly, bewildered lady who stole bread to feed her grandkids. And as the elderly lady left the courtroom in tears, the whole of the court who had been fined stood and applauded Fiorello LaGuardia. <laughs> Folks, we are all just whosoever's. We expect perfection from others, but want people to show us grace. Which is why I wanna land for a moment on this subject, kindness. Can I ask you this question once again? Whatever happened to being kind? Whatever happened to making the choice on a daily basis that we would be a kind people? The choice to be kind. Kindness is a wonderful thing. Jesus says in Matthew 7, 12, so in everything, do to others what you would have them to do to you. For this sums up all of the law and all of the prophets. Kindness. Kindness makes a person attractive. Be kind. Can I speak to the men and say this? If you're trying to get a girl, stop going for the stud look and make a decision. Be kind. Because kindness is attractive. Girls, can I speak to you and remember this, that men are from Mars and women are from, Ve from Venus. Stop trying to make us from Venus. Be kind, let us be men. Kindness is an attractive thing. I love it when we walk through the cities and my son makes a decision, as he always does, to give money to the homeless. Whoever that person is, whatever their background, every time he does that, he says, Dad, can I have some of your money to give it to that homeless person? Kindness is attractive. And every time he does it, just when I think I can't love my son anymore, he does an act of kindness. Musos, come and join me. Uh, I, I want you to know that kindness is, is powerful because everybody you meet is fighting a battle you know nothing of. Folks, be kind. Be kind. That person in the workplace who we may be judgmental of or critical of, be kind. You don't know what they've been through to get to where they are. You don't know what their childhood looked like. You don't know whether mum and dad, whether both or one were there. You don't know whether they were absent or not. Be kind. I remember two years ago telling you about this moment where I was driving my daughter slowly down one of the side streets in Manchester and we couldn't go any faster or any further. The reason being because there was an elderly lady who was in front of us. I didn't know it was an elderly lady. This, I just saw this big, big, thick sheepskin type jacket. This person was walking with all these bags and, and Georgia was kind of saying, Dad, we're in a rush. I said, I know I'm stuck behind a hobbit. She said, Dad, that's rude. 
And as this person got out of the way, I looked and I saw this really elderly lady weathered in her face, heavy laden with big bags. And do you know something? I felt ashamed. And so I should have. Because I don't know her. I don't know the battle she's been fighting to get to where she is. Kindness is understanding that every person we meet is fighting a battle. Kindness is a wonderful thing. Kindness, we rise by lifting people. Be kind. I'm not just talking about kindness to people who are, who are lower, inverted commas, in society than us. I'm talking about helping people around you to get a promotion as well. Be kind. Folks, I wanna encourage you to, to be kind. Kindness begins with me. Kindness begins with you. Wouldn't it be wonderful if in Greater Manchester we created this revolution of kindness? Be kind. Folks, on social media, be kind. In your conversations with each other, be kind. In the way that you dissect and analyse audacious church, be kind. Because there are so many people working so hard behind the scenes, people who, who, who receive no remuneration. They do it simply because they love God and love the church. Be kind. Recently, I was in, speaking in a, a mega church and before I spoke, the preacher, the pastor of the church, he said, before I introduce Pastor Glint to you, he said, folks, I want, want you to know that we're having a situation where some of you are swearing at our car park attendants who are just trying to help you park the car on a Sunday. I thought, wow, well, what happened to simply being kind? Kindness begins with me, it begins with you. You remember the story about a Sunday school teacher who said to the class, hey kids, what's kindness? A little boy put up his hand. He said, Miss, I know what kindness. Kindness is when my mum brings me some toast in the morning. And the Sunday school teacher said, that's a good answer. But she said, but Tommy, what's loving kindness? She said, that, he said, that's easy. Loving kindness is when she puts jam on it. <laughs> Folks, put some jam on it. Go over the top with kindness. Let's make more of an effort than ever before because whosoever is here. We are all the whosoever. I love this because what I've discovered about the whosoever is this, is that whosoever is still God's plan. He's not changed His plan. God works with whosoever's. Your Peter's in the Bible, he was a whosoever. The Apostle Paul, he was a whosoever. In fact, all through the New Testament, all through the Old Testament, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the famous ones, they were nothing more than whosoever's. And I want you to know that whosoever is still God's plan. And if whosoever is still God's plan, then church, I wanna suggest that we need to allow God to do whatever with whosoever. Which is why I take just this moment to run on a tangent and talk not only about kindness, but also about forgiveness. I know that every single one of us in this place, I know that every single person watching online, I know that we all feel certain amounts of injustice because of what people have said about us, because of what people have done to us, people who we trusted, who, who we trusted, but they ended up stabbing us in the back. But I want you to understand that those people who acted, who spoke, who did those things, they're whosoever too. Folks, what could exclude you from the forgiveness of God? What could exclude you? Well, Glenn, God forgives everything, really? Let me read you this verse, Jesus speaking. Matthew seven, uh, sorry, Matthew six. But if you do not forgive you, me, if you do not forgive other people their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. <sighs> Can I ask, is there anyone you need to forgive? This is a constant battle for me. 
really don't mind what people say about me and, and do to me. I don't really, really mind. But the greatest challenge for me is when people say things about Sophia, my kids, and the bride of Christ. And right now I'm walking through a journey of two people who I, I am walking through the journey of forgiveness in my heart. But Jesus says this, Glenn, if you don't forgive people, then it is very hard. In fact, your Father cannot, will not forgive your sins. I find that such a challenge to realise that it is my forgiveness of others that is key. Folks, can I say about this? Forgiveness is not about letting other people off the hook. It's about letting you off the hook. Because you can't write the next chapter of your life while you're rereading the last chapter of your life. Forgiveness is not telling the perpetrator of the crime against you that it is okay. Forgiveness is telling them, I'll be okay. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that all the nobodies trying to become somebodies, all the imperfect people, the whosoever may receive eternal life. For God did not come into this world to condemn the world, but that through His Son, Jesus, you and I might be saved. Now listen. It's one thing to be loved by God, but another thing to receive His love. I finish with this. In the Minor Prophets in the Old Testament, there's a character called Hosea. God speaks to Hosea and says, Hosea, what I want you to do is I want you to go and find an adulterous, promiscuous woman, a prostitute, and I want you to marry her. So the Bible tells us that Hosea went to marry a lady called Goma. He brought her out of prostitution. She became his bride. He dressed her well. He looked after her. They even had kids, nice home, beautiful car, white picket fence. But the thing is this, is that Goma kept running away and going back into her life of prostitution. Hosea would say, that's it, I'm done. Don't wanna be married to her anymore. And God would say to Hosea, Hosea, go and find your wife. Go and rescue her again. And so he would go, he would look in all the brothels, all the houses, he would find his wife, Goma, and he would bring her home and he would forgive her and he would dress her in fine clothes. But there was this part of her life, she could not escape the pull, the tug of this old world. And, and the reason that story is told in the Bible is to let you and I know that that's kind of really what it's like with God's love in us that in lifestyle, in our words, in our thinking, in our heart, so often we turn our back on God and we do, do our own thing. But God all the time keeps coming and saying, I'm, I'm pursuing you. I've got you. Grace, peace, joy, mercy, His love, follow me all the days of my life. God's just after you. Friend, I want you to know, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as the Lord and Saviour, can I just put it this way? He's after you. You're gonna be sitting on a plane, a train, an automobile. You're gonna find yourself with people who are gonna talk to you about Jesus. Why? Because His love. Surely it'll follow us all the days of our life. Imagine how hard it was for Jose to love someone who would not receive His love. Back in 1989, I was in my youth group in East Manchester and a man came to tell us the story of Hosea and Goma. He was an older guy in our church. And to be honest, this guy in our church, though we liked him a lot, he wasn't cool. And so we were distracted. You know what, typical teenagers, we were distracted. And we kind of heard the story about Hosea and Goma. He told it pretty well, to be fair. And then he stopped and he said this. He said, you know, that's my life. And we looked up, we thought, 
you're married to a prostitute? And then he said, I want you to know I'm not married to a prostitute. He says, but I got married 30 years ago. And from that day to now, never once has my wife told me she loves me. In fact, over and over again, she tells me how she thinks she made the worst mistake of her life in marrying me. And it doesn't matter what I do, she won't receive my love. And I remember being 15, 16, being heartbroken for this man in our church who told us about a woman who would not receive his love. Can I just say this as I close? He loves you. He loves you. Oh, He loves you. We just gotta receive it.